Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a scientific content specialist at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installments in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series entitled Virus Culture Fundamentals, Methods and Strategies for Viral Propagation, presented by our panel of expert virologists. Adria Allen, Alex Picarillo, and Megan Yaki are all senior biologists at ATCC. In this presentation, our speakers will tap into ATCC's vast viral culture experience for an in-depth look at viral propagation strategies used at ATCC. They will cover the basic propagation types, focusing on protocol optimization, authentication, and troubleshooting strategies. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. So with that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Adria Allen. Thanks, Brian. Before we get into today's topic, I'm going to take a minute to talk about ATCC. ATCC is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1925. It's headquartered in Manassas, Virginia, and has an R&D and services center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. It is a leading global supplier of authenticated cell lines, viruses, which is the focus of this webinar, and microbial standards. In today's talk, I will start off by going over virus fundamentals. Then Megan Yaki will take over and talk about how we authenticate and ensure the quality of our viral products. And Alex Picarillo will wrap up this webinar with troubleshooting strategies that we use. Now on to the fundamentals. In this section, I'm gonna go over the basics. This includes the basics about viruses, virus propagation, and virus hosts. I will wrap up the section by going over three common infection strategies that are used when propagating virus. Viruses are a pathogenic intracellular organism that requires living cells in order to multiply. They're extremely diverse. Their genome can be composed of DNA or RNA, it can be double-stranded or single-stranded, and it can be segmented or non-segmented. For the purpose of this talk, when talking about the structure of the virus, we're gonna be focusing mainly on whether a virus is enveloped or not enveloped. A non-enveloped virus is a virus that packages its genetic material in a protein shell or capsid. This capsid is what's exposed to the virus and disrupting the integrity of this capsid can be very difficult. So non-enveloped viruses tend to remain infectious for long periods of time outside the host cell. An example of a non-enveloped virus is norovirus. If you've ever read about a norovirus outbreak at a restaurant, chances are the place had to be completely shut down and thoroughly disinfected before it was allowed to reopen. The, you don't really tend to hear these types of stories when it comes to envelope viruses like influenza. In addition to a capsid, an envelope virus is surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer containing viral proteins. Envelope viruses do not persist in the environment nearly as well as non-envelope viruses, because as soon as a phospho phospholipid bilayer is disrupted, they become non-infectious. When it comes to propagating a virus, it is very important to understand its life cycle. The basic life cycle of a virus revolves around the host cell and is broken down into five steps, attachment, penetration, replication, assembly, and release. During attachment, a virus binds to a susceptible host. This is a lock and key type of relationship where the virus surf surface proteins act as a key and the cell surface receptor acts as the lock. If a cell does not have the correct receptor, the virus will not attach and the cell is considered not susceptible. After the virus successfully attaches to the host, 
The next step is penetration, where the virus enters the cell. Once inside the cell, the virus can begin to replicate. Something to remember is that just because a virus can get inside a cell, it doesn't mean that it can replicate inside the cell. Viruses can only replicate in permissive hosts. During replication, the host cell is making copies of the virus genome and producing viral proteins. Eventually, these components will assemble into infectious viral particles. The release step is where the infectious viral particles leave the host to infect other cells. There are three basic ways this is accomplished, cell lysis, viral shedding, and remaining cell associated to the infected host. When the release mechanism is cell lysis, the host cell is destroyed and the assembled viral particles are released all at once. Another strategy is to slowly release viral particles over time. This is known as viral shedding. This can be done by prepackaging viral particles in vesicles that are then carried to the cell membrane and then released into the extracellular space. This process is known as exocytosis. Both enveloped and non-enveloped viruses can use this strategy. A viral shedding strategy exclusive to enveloped viruses is budding. When a virus buds, it borrows the host cell membrane to create its own viral envelope and is released from the cell individually. This process does not immediately destroy the host cell, but it will slowly use up the host cell membrane until the cell eventually dies. Third release strategy is that the virus doesn't completely release from the host at all and remains cell associated. A virus that is cell associated either loses infectivity quickly after release from the host cell or the virus is dependent on the host cell to aid in infecting new cells. At ATCC, we focus on mainly the attachment and release steps of the virus life cycle to determine what viral propagation strategy to pursue. Vir viral propagation can be broken down into three basic steps, inoculation, incubation, and harvest. The focus of the inoculation step is to facilitate attachment between virus and host. The incubation step allows for the virus to replicate and the harvest step is when the propagated virus is collected. What specifically gets harvested during the step is dependent on the virus. This process of inoculation, incubation, and harvest is considered a viral passage. Every time a virus is passaged, mutations in the genome can occur. This means that a virus collected at the end of a viral passage might be slightly different than the virus used during the inoculation of that passage. Mutations are also likely to occur when changing the type of host the virus is propagated in because it causes different selective pressures. In addition to the authentication and quality control methods to validate the viral strain being propagated, the virus propagation history is also monitored. Uh, this is known as the passage history. It's a quantitative chronicle chronological history of the host used to propagate a specific viral product. Passage histories are useful for keeping track of host changes and the number of viral passages that have occurred since the isolation of the original virus. At ATCC, we focus on propagating viruses in either cell culture or embryonated eggs. Other virus hosts exist, such as mouse models, but at ATCC, our focus is on producing virus for both research and clinical diagnostic communities, which basically translates to us needing the capacity to produce large quantities of virus quickly. Eggs are a useful viral host because the interior of an egg is a sterile environment. There are a variety of tissues and enzymes available for the, for the viruses to take advantage of, and the inoculation process is simple. You inject the virus and that's it. A virus that is commonly grown in eggs is human influenza virus. This virus is injected into the allantoic fluid of the egg and incubated for two to three days at 33 to 35 degrees Celsius, which is the relative temperature of our upper respiratory tract. And then afterwards, the allantoic fluid is harvested. A limitation with eggs is that despite the diversity of tissues, it's not a suitable host for all viruses. Another limitation is that there is a diversity of tissues, proteins, and enzymes present that are not all necessary for virus replication. This can be problematic when eggs are used during vaccine production because people with egg allergies will not be able to receive the vaccine. The other common host is cell culture, which is a highly controlled artificial environment. Uh, we use cell lines, which are developed from a single cell and consist of cells with a uniform genetic makeup. 
Cell lines are usually adherent or suspension cells. Adherent cells attach to the surface of the vessel to create a single, single layer of cells called a monolayer. Suspension cells remain floating in the cell growth medium and just hang out. The benefit of using cell culture to propagate is that it's easy to scale up production and propagation is highly reproducible because the cell culture is such a highly controlled environment. The limitations of cell culture stem, stem from it being a highly controlled environment. You have to choose which cell line you use very carefully because the genetic uniformity, it's really important that the host cell line is that is chosen is both susceptible and permissive to the virus in question. Since cell culture is an artificial environment, the virus growth media must contain everything the virus needs to complete its life cycle that the host cell might be lacking, such as enzymes or nutrients. The inoculation step for cell culture is slightly more complicated than egg inoculation. There are three basic steps, preparation, absorption, and feeding. In the preparation step, both the host and the virus need to be, for lack of a better word, prepared for infection. For the host cells, this usually means removing the cell growth media. The media that cells need to grow is not always what your virus needs to replicate. In some cases, what your cells need will actually keep the virus from replicating. Preparing the virus is as simple as, sometimes as simple as determining how much of the virus stock you need and making the inoculum. The inoculum is the virus containing media used during the absor absorption step. However, some viruses either need assistance in being fully released from the host cells or need to be enzymatically activated before the virus can attach and infect cells. So this is all part of the preparation step. After the virus and host cells have been prepared, then there is the absorption step. The purpose of the step is to facilitate attachment between the virus and the host. One way we increase the likelihood of attachment is to keep the volume of the inoculum low. This increases the surface area to volume ratio and increases the probability of viral particles encountering the host cells and actually being able to attach. The absorption step is usually one to three hours. The last step of inoculation is feeding. This is where viral growth media is added. The purpose of viral growth media is to keep the host cells alive long enough to replicate virus and to provide the virus with anything it requires to replicate that the host cell might not provide itself. The incubation step is a waiting game where the infection is allowed to progress until enough replication has occurred to harvest the infection. But the question then becomes, when do you harvest? For most viruses, it's based on the presentation of cytopathic effects or degenerative changes observed in host cells. Some common cytopathic effects are cell rounding and clumping, which can be observed in the human adenovirus 41 infection, as well as cell enlargement and sensatia. Sensatia is when infected cells fuse together into one giant cell with multiple nuclei. You can see an example of cessatia in the photograph of, um, of the murine hepatitis infection. When I was working with this virus, I found it really interesting to observe giant cells with dozens of nuclei speckled throughout the monolayer. This is my favorite kind of cytopathic effect. Not all viruses cause cytopathic effect in their hosts. And yes, I have worked with viruses like that as well. For these viruses, we harvest based on incubation length and have to authenticate that the virus is present using other methods which Megan will talk about later. Now that you've had an introduction into when to harvest, let's go over harvesting. To recap, when viruses release from host cells, they either exit the cell via cell lysis, viral shedding, or they remain cell associated to live infected cells. The type of virus you are harvesting dictates what harvest method to use. There are two basic methods, scraping and dissociation. When you scrape to harvest, any cells that are attached to the surface of the flask are manually removed. This method is generally used for viruses that aren't cell associated because the survival of the host cell is not relevant to the infectivity of the virus. However, for cell associated viruses, we use enzymes to cleave the proteins that adhere the cells to the flask surface. The infected host cells survive this harvest process 
and can still help the cell-associated virus infect other cells later on. All right, so now that you've, we've gone over the basics, let's uh, talk about three basic infection strategies we use. The first infection strategy I'm gonna talk about is one that I used on the very first virus I propagated at ATCC, which was murine norovirus. This virus is non-enveloped and persists in the environment for extended periods of time. The strategy I used to propagate this virus was to infect the host cells with a small quantity of virus. That way I could get multiple rounds of infection within the one viral passage. Not all virus particles that are released from the first round of replication actually go back and attach to new cells and infect. So there tends to be a buildup of viral particles in the growth media. Um, so the picture that you're looking at is actually, was taken two days after the infection and all that remains of the host cell is cellular debris. But that's all right because it's a non-enveloped virus and it's still viable in the viral growth media. The second strategy is one that I use with cell-associated viruses. Bacillus cell zoster virus, which is a human herpes 3 virus, but most of you will know it as chickenpox or shingles, is a virus where its infectivity is heavily dependent on remaining cell associated to the infected cells. For the strain VR 1433 in particular, it is unable to infect its host cell line, BSC1 cells, when it's cell-free because the cell line does not contain the proper receptor needed for cell-free virus to attach. However, when this Vicillus zoster virus is cell-associated, it doesn't need that receptor to infect other cells. Because of this, instead of harvesting viral particles, um, like the previous example, the goal of harvesting is to harvest infected live cells. The way we go about doing this is to infect the host cells with enough cell-associated virus that most of the uninfected cells become infected during the initial absorption step and end up being at the relatively same stage of infection during the harvest step. The third infection strategy is used for persistent infection. In persistent infections, an infected host cell will divide into two infected daughter cells. Cells that weren't infected during inoculation can become infected by viral particles that butt off from these infected cells. Because the cells continue to grow and divide after infection, a viral passage is, divide the same, is defined the same way a cell passage is defined, where every time the cells are cell cultured, it's considered a new viral passage. This also means that when you start with just viral particles and host cells, the cells only need to be inoculated once. The interesting thing about persistence infections is that it can be harvested in two different ways. You can either harvest the virus particles or you can harvest the infected cells as a persistently infected cell line. A challenge with persistent infections is they don't regularly display cytopathic effect. When I was working with feline leukemia virus, in order to be able to tell the infected cells from non-infected cells, I ended up having to use fluorescently tagged antibodies. Um, in the picture, the green cells are the ones that are positive for feline leukemia virus, and the red cells are negative. Um, this concludes the virus fundamentals portion of this presentation. Let me pass off the mic to Megan Yaki, who will talk about how we authenticate and ensure the quality of our viral products. Thank you, Adria. This section will address our authentication, quality control, and preservation methods for our virology items. ATCC operates under several quality accreditations. We are committed to providing quality products and services to life science communities around the world. We have an experienced quality management team that ensures that the acquisition, authentication, preservation, development, and distribution of biological materials are being performed under and conform to a documented quality management system. Today, we'll be going over assays involved with viral viability and quantification authentication of our viral products and methods used to ensure we are providing quality items that meet ATCC's high standards. Determining the concentration of infectious particles in any given virus suspension is essential 
to the propagation of quality viral tools. There are three main methods of viral quantification. Measuring infectivity through inoculation of cells or eggs. Listed here are the three staple methods that are used in determining the virus ability to propagate at a stable rate. They are carried out using serial diluted endpoint assays inoculated in either cells or eggs. The methods listed here are used to establish optimal multiplicity of infections, or MOIs, and observe the stability of our viral products through increases or decreases in titer between passages. Analyzing viral protein concentrations or levels of gene expression also, also offer a way to quantify viral particles. These assays are less time consuming overall and a good fallback for when CPE is not visible or IFA antibodies are not available. The main drawback with using this type of assay is that it is, may measure the number of viral particles, but is not able to determine viral infectivity. The third type of viral quantification involves counting the virus particles directly with either a transmission electron microscope or viral particle counters. These are useful assays, especially with low titer items that do not show CPE or are so low in concentration, they are not easily assessed using ELISA or qPCR. However, these assays are also limited by their inability to measure viral infectivity. For ATCC viral products, the first method, measuring infectivity through inoculation of cells or eggs, is what we typically use to determine viral quantification and viability. Let's take a look into black assays. Black assays are the golden standard and the method that has been used for many years. Black assays require an endpoint serial dilution to determine viral titers. They are also a common tool used for viral purification. Black assays are restricted to the viruses that induce cell lysis or death, such as for coronaviruses, influenza viruses, and herpes simplex 1 and 2. An endpoint serial dilution is performed and inoculated onto a nearly confluent monolayer of cells. Once incubation is complete, a tempered agarose overlay containing AGM is added to each sample. The assay is then incubated for the required number of days based on viral type. Here is where plaque assay methods begin to differ. Several different plaque assay methods exist, even virus-specific ones. A few examples involve the following treatments. One of the oldest techniques removes the overlay, requires fixing the cells, and finally staining the cells with crystal violet to easily count plaques. A second common method adds a second overlay mixed with neutral red for plaque counting. Virus-specific assays can use immunohistochemistry to confirm plaques, increasing specificity of the assay by using virus-specific antibodies. We use an assay of this type for some of our influenza strains. PFU, or plaque forming units, are calculated by counting the averaging the number of plaques per dilution. Counting is limited to wells that contain 5 to 100 plaques. That average is multiplied by the virus dilution. This number is then divided by the inoculum volume to determine plaque forming units per milliliter. I have added photos of a recent item that I grew, VR2248, which is equine herpes virus 1. This virus is known to cause abortions in horses. This was a strain that we had not previously applied a plaque assay to. This plaque assay cuts a significant amount of time in production as it only takes three days versus the viral tire, which can take up to eight days. Our next endpoint dilution assay method is the TCID50. Viral titers can be determined in vitro by calculating tissue culture infectious dose. For tissue culture adapted viral strains, this calculation is attained through an endpoint dilution assay in cell culture. The most reproducible endpoint of the dilution assay is the dilution of the virus that will produce a pathological change in 50% of the cell cultures inoculated. This number is expressed as 50% of the infectious dose, or TCID50. This assay can take 3 to 14 days based on virus and cell type. The end of this assay is determined once it presents no change in CPE for at least 3 days. It relies on the presence and detection of CPE and is scored based on the presence or absence. This data is then used to calculate what dilution of the virus will present CPE in 50% of the cells inoculated. 
The GCC uses the Reed Munich method to calculate TCID50 per mil. The results of these assays ensure the viability of our viral products as ATCC requires a minimum titer of 5 times 10 in the third. It also allows us to observe any propagation changes between different passages for production or historical seed lots. In some cases, viral products do not produce CPE and are not measurable in this way. For this, we will look into how IFA and PCR or reverse transcriptase PCR are paired with an endpoint dilution assay. The first one we will look into is IFA assay. The immunofluorescence assay or IFA is a method of detecting and visualizing a specific antigen in a sample using an antibody or antiserum conjugated with a fluorescent dye, which is observed by a microscope equipped to detect fluorescence. This assay can be used to interpret results of the TCID50 by the absence or presence of immunofluorescence instead of CPE. It allows you to clearly visualize cells infected with virus. This assay has a higher specificity over a standard TCID50 as it uses specific viral antibodies. Once incubation period of a TCID50 has ended, the cell monolayers are fixed. The wells are then stained either using either the direct or indirect method. With direct antibody staining, the primary antibody is directly conjugated to a fluorophore. For the indirect method, the primary antibody is unconjugated, and the fluorophore conjugated secondary antibody directed against the primary antibody is used for detection. This actually happens to be one of my favorite assays, as the resulting images are fascinating. The photo above is of VR1979 a human adenovirus that I recently adapted to a new cell line. The green fluorescence indicates presence of the virus, which allows you to clearly visualize the infected cells. Next, we will take a look into RT-PCR and PCR as this method of a viral titer verification. Another way to verify TCID50 assays is by using reverse transcriptase PCR for RNA items or PCR for DNA items to determine absence or presence of viral product. This method is used when CPE is not visible and there are no available antibodies for IFA staining. This assay is not as indicative of viral infectivity as the others, as presence or absence of RNA or DNA is not necessarily a representation of the virus infecting the cell. The process is fairly labor intensive as each well of the TCID50 assay is harvested and extracted separately. Once extracted, RT-PCR or PCR is performed individually for each well to determine viral titer based on EGEL results. Here is shown an EGEL for the viral titer of VR837. This is a virus that Alex recently produced that required an extreme amount of work. You can see the intensity of the bands decreases as the dilution increases and a clearly defined endpoint. Another type of endpoint dilution assay is the CEID50. Chicken embryo infectious dose is a useful tool in identifying a viral title using inoculated chicken eggs. Eggs are required to be 9 to 11 days old, depending on the virus for inoculation. Before any work can be performed, eggs must be candled, identifying and marking the air sac and embryo's eye. Once ready to inoculate, a serial dilution of virus is inoculated into the eggs. After a lot of incubation, allantoic fluid is harvested from each egg and stored individually. Influenza is commonly tested in this way. In order to verify and measure the outcome of CDID50, we use the HA assay. The HA assay, or hemagglutination assay, uses a 0.5% turkey or chicken red blood cell solution that tests the viral product's ability to agglutinate or bind to red blood cells. A one to one mixture of red blood cells and virus sample is taken from each of the harvested egg dilutions and placed on a 96 well B bottom plate. After a 30 minute incubation at room temperature, photos are taken of the before and after drip test. For the drip test, the plate is held vertically for less than or equal to 30 seconds to determine if each button present on the plate drips. If it does not drip, it is considered a positive sample. In the photo above, you can see the positive samples where the lattice forms. And where the blood drips, you can see the negative sample. The CAID50 titer is then calculated using the Reed Munich method. From here, we will be moving on to authentication methods at ATCC. 
ATCC has recently moved to using next generation sequencing techniques for authentication of our products. NGS technology has revolutionized genomic research. NGS is also known as high throughput sequencing or massively parallel sequencing. NGS can sequence hundreds of thousands of genes or whole genomes in a few hours, a feat that recently took nearly a decade of data analysis. Genomic sequencing has limitless potential for viral research. Our NGS generated data is aligned to a reference sequence with at least a 98% match for authentication. NGS can be used to determine the presence of mutations or variations in viral genomes. Host cell adaptations are known to alter viral genomes. Before performing this procedure, NGS testing is processed before and after production of the item to observe if, the, if these events have occurred in the virology genome. NGS can also identify contamination, which Alex will go into more detail on our troubleshooting section. Another of our authentication methods involves Sanger sequencing. Sanger sequencing is only able to analyze one fragment at a time. It generates highly specific data that may not catch mutation or contamination events. At ATCC, it's used as an authentication method for our nucleic acid products. Results can be compared to NGS sequencing as a second method of verification if needed. It is generally unable to detect mutations, variations, or contaminants, which is one of the main reasons behind ATCC switch to NGS item. The above diagram shows the process of Sanger sequencing. From here, we'll take a look at the quality control testing method used at ATCC. The sterility of our products is essential at ATCC, and each of our items are observed in vitro and tested for the presence of bacterial contamination. All ATCC items are grown without antibiotics. This requires that our biologists have exceptional aseptic techniques. For virology cell culture items, bacterial contamination is usually easily to spot. Turbid media, pH changes, and microscopic observation can quickly identify contamination events. To ensure that our items are sterile, they undergo a 14-day sterility verification, testing both anaerobic and aerobic conditions. At ATCC, sterility processes have evolved into using state-of-the-art technology that allows for a real-time detection of contamination events. <clears throat> Not only are we able to detect contamination at a faster rate, but we are able to identify specifically what the contaminant is in a very short amount of time. Our bacterial counter uses individual bottles for testing for the presence of anaerobic and aerobic microorganisms. These are inoculated with a syringe, which greatly reduces the possibility of cross-contamination, unlike traditional broth tubes. Molotov, or matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization time of flight, is used to determine the pattern of proteins in an intact bacterial or fungal sample. It can identify bacteria, mycoplasma, and fungi by only using one colony. Our other QC method is testing the presence of mycoplasma. Mycoplasma are the smallest known free-living organisms. They are a genus of bacteria that lack a cell wall and as such are resistant to antibiotics that target cell wall synthesis. They also lack nuclei along other cell organelles. Mycoplasma have the ability to survive without oxygen and are known to be pleomorphic, known for their pleomorphic abilities. Mycoplasma are often found as contaminants in research laboratories, especially in cell culture. In vitro, they are difficult to detect as they do not present the same changes as other bacterial contaminants. Generally, there's no change in media turbidity or pH, and they cannot be detected microscopically. Mycoplasma cause a number of problems in viral passages, as they are known to gradually transform cell morphology and genetic structure. Infected cells can also present as hyperchromatic. This leads to inhibited cell growth and viral replication, and can also lead to unexplained cell death. To ensure ATCC produces top quality items, we have implemented QC procedures that ensure our items are mycoplasma free. We also offer this as a testing service. We have two options for testing, direct and indirect culture mycoplasma testing and testing using our universal mycoplasma kit. The direct culture method uses broth and auger 
which allows for the isolation of cultivatable strains. Our indirect culture method uses a fluorochrome DNA stain that allows for mycoplasma detection through a microscope equipped with fluorescence. For a second mycoplasma service, ATCC has designed a universal mycoplasma detection kit that detects 60 of the most common serotypes. One of our allergies application is to test for and perform mycoplasma cleanups when necessary. We generally have two methods, which Alex will address in detail in our troubleshooting section. Finally, we will look into the storage for our virology items. The ability of viruses that are not cell associated are best maintained through rapid freezing. And this method, samples are quickly frozen using liquid nitrogen vapor. Freeze drying is a process where water and other solvents are removed from a frozen product via sublimation. Sublimation occurs when a frozen liquid goes directly to a gaseous state without entering a liquid state. The freeze drying process results in a stable, readily rehydrated product. Numerous factors can affect the viability of a recovered virus. These critical parameters can include the composition of cryoprotectant and the viral titer. For cell-associated viruses, in order to obtain a optimal cell viability upon recovery, modifying the cryopreservation pres procedure may be required for each viral strain. Cell-associated viruses require control rate freeze. ATVC provides the cool cell alcohol-free cryopreservation pres container which is an easy-to-use device designed to support cell, viral, bacterial, protozoan, and fungal cultures using slow freezing rate of minus 1 degree C per minute and a standard minus 80 degree C freezer. This procedure prevents ice formation that could reduce cell viability. Final cell-associated viruses are stored in LN to preserve integrity of cells. From here, Alex will take over our troubleshooting section. Thank you so much, Megan. I will now go over what MSET Virology's role specifically is as it relates to R&D and troubleshooting. There are some instances where viral replication and propagation can fail. Thus, it is up to MSET Virology to understand what may cause these problems, and more importantly, how we can prevent these problems for future production. There are several growth issues that may contribute to unsuccessful replication and propagation, and I will go over each of them in more detail. These issues include MOI, or multi multiplicity of infection, is not fully optimized. The virus of interest is not adapted to the most appropriate host cell line. The in vitro environment is missing important growth factors, such as the lack of crucial enzymes or complications with the media formulation. And lastly, contaminants in the cell culture and or the virus itself. And just to reiterate, it is the goal of MSAT Virology to perform R&D as needed to resolve these growth issues and to improve the overall quality of existing viral products. Of existing viral products. First, I will go over MOI optimization. MOI, or multiplicity of infection, represents the ratio of infectious agents, whether it be a phage or virus, to infectious targets most commonly cells of a tissue culture or embryonic, embryonic eggs. Optimal MOI will therefore vary depending on the number of infecting agents, how quickly those agents attach to the host cells, how much time is allowed for attachment of the agents to the host cells, and how many host cells there are to attach to. When it comes to replicating and propagating a virus, MSET virology prefers to use MOI versus the dilution of the virus. MOI calculations depend on the titer of the virus, whether it be from a TCID50 or PAC assay, while dilutions do not. And unlike an MOI, dilutions depend on using the same seed source material, material for every time the virus needs to be replicated, which is, a which is a major disadvantage when the seed is constantly being consumed from HECC's inventory. MOIs can be high or low, and that will be relative depending on the virus of interest. High MOIs requ require that every cell in the culture to be infected, while low MOIs are used when multiple, multiple cycles of infections are needed. Therefore, you can choose a higher MOI to achieve a higher infection rate, 
However, it is always important to take the potential toxicity of, of a viral infection on the cells into consideration. Cell-associated viruses, for example, need all of their host cells to be infected at the same time. Therefore, a high MOI is more optimal. But viruses that do not degrade quickly in the environment can achieve a higher titer by infecting a few, a few cells at once so that there are more replication cycles in the infection. Thus, a low MOI can lead to more replication cycles and subsequently more viral, part viral particles present in the media. Changing the MOI also changes the incubation time because of the added or reduced number of replication cycles needed to reach the same level of overall infection. For example, one virus I have recently worked with, BK polyomavirus, or ATCC VR837, requires a high MOI of 1.0 be needed to have almost all of its host cells to be infected at 15 days post-infection, or DPI. A low MOI of 0 0.01 was also tested, but at the same DPI, none of its host cells were infected. Thus, a much more longer incubation time would be needed to show the same CPE results, which were slime and detachment and refractile cell rounding as the 1.0 MOI. Next, I will discuss the importance of adapting to the most beneficial host cell line. Just because the virus can replicate and propagate in a cell line does not mean it will replicate and propagate well, which can lead to issues in, in reproducibility. Many viruses are host-specific, meaning that they only infect certain types of cells within tissue. This is called tropism. For example, a poliovirus shows tropism for tissues of the brain and spinal cord, while other viruses, such, such as influenza, has primary tropism for the respiratory tract. Numerous viruses in our catalog, especially much older items, are sent by depositors from primary cells, eggs, or even in vivo, in vivo models, and therefore they will need to be adapted to an ATCC cell line. MSET virology prefers to propagate viruses in host cells for at least three consecutive passages to ensure that the virus is fully adapted to the host. Another virus I'm currently working with is the human Coxsackie virus. This virus was deposited to ATCC in 1969 and was propagated in the brain and limbs of suckling mice. I am attempting to adapt this virus to ATCC through CL136 RD cells, or human muscle cells. As you can see, by attempting a third passage after my second one, the CPE of the virus has, has substantiated with more prominent spots of monolayer degeneration as well as much more cell clumping and rounding. Environmental growth factors are another issue that need to be resolved, if needed. The appropriate medium for the cell growth media, or CGM, and virus growth media, or VGM, is needed to maintain the host cell line and the virus itself. The two most common medias that MSET virology typically use are EMEM, or Eagle's Medium Essential Medium, and DMEM, or the Beckles Modified Eagle Medium. EMEM and DMEM may sound similar, but they are far from. EMEM is a simple medium that is often fortified with additional supplements, while DMEM has roughly twice the concentration of amino acids and four times the amount of vitamins as EMEM. Therefore, it is critical to choose the most suitable one. MSET virology also prefers to use the same media for both the host cell line and the virus. For example, if the host cells use EMEM, do not switch the virus to EMEM, and vice versa. The percentage of serum is also crucial to successful maintenance of the cells and the virus. While most cell lines use 10% serum for their media, ATCC recommends de decreasing the percentage of serum to 2% for the BGM, as higher levels of serum can interfere with viral attachment. It is also important to decide if the media is missing any enzymes that are necessary for successful replication and propagation. Some viruses, such as influenza and rotaviruses, are dependent on trypsin, a protease that breaks down protein. As a component of the AGM, trypsin can act as a proteolytic, proteolytic cleavage for virus proteins to allow for the successful attachment to the host cell. The last major growth issue that virology takes into consideration is contaminants. 
viruses can become contaminated with various bacteria, fungi, and or, the, uh, and or other virus DNA and RNA cultures, especially much older items in the ATCC catalog. Virus cross-contamination can be detected by NGS or next generation sequencing and resolved by plaque purification. The most common contaminant MSAT virology deals with is mycoplasma, which can be removed by either mycoplasma removal agent, MRA, or diethyl ether. MRA is an antibody used for envelope viruses. It is selected from mycoplasma and it will not interfere with envelope viruses. Non-envelope viruses, on the other hand, use diethyl ether to remove mycoplasma by destroying its lipid bilayers, which can prominently be seen in the diagram above. Envelope viruses would thus get destroyed as well by the ether since they also possess a lipid layer. MSET Virology has recently performed many mycoplasma cleanups on rhinoviruses in our catalog, as well as adapting these items to ATCC human lung cells, or CCL75WI38 cells. Other bacteria and fungi can be removed by filtration or the use of antibiotics or antimycotics, respectfully. If the virus is cell-associated, cells can be disrupted by freezing and thawing material or sonicating the suspension. All of these growth issues have applied to existing viral products at ATCC, but what about new accession items? I'm happy to say that MSET Virology directly works with these items as well. Viral samples are sent to ATCC from researchers and scientists from all over the world to be deposited for eventual propagation and authentication. With more than 2,000 viruses in our catalog, including type strings from different host species, ATCC guarantees that every viral preparation made is as close as possible to the original culture deposit, while taking any necessary measures, including MOI optimization and adapting to the most beneficial host to provide the best product available, available to our customers. Have a sample you're thinking about dropping off? Please contact the Central Accessioning Unit at cau at atcc.org or visit the website listed below. So in conclusion, today we discussed three main topics, the first of which was virus fundamentals. Virus propagation strategies depend on how a virus infects and how it is released from host cells. And host cells must be both susceptible and permissive for viral propagation to be successful. successful. We also talked about the importance of authentication and quality control. ATCC uses a variety of methods to ensure the viability the viability and authentication of our viral products, and the integrity of our viral items is preserved through proper storage techniques. Lastly, we touched upon the role of MSET virology and how it relates to troubleshooting strategies. The main goal of MSET virology is to perform the R&D to fix viral replication and propagation issues, including optimizing for MOI, adapting to the most appropriate cell line, adding the ideal environmental growth factors, and removing contaminants from the virus culture. And viral samples deposited to ATCC will be properly replicated and authenticated while taking any essential measures by MSAT virology for successful propagation. And with that, we will now go into any questions from the audience. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Alex. In just a few moments, we will begin our Q&A session uh, please use the chat function available through the webinar program to submit your questions. The recorded webinar presentation will be available on demand on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. And it looks like Anima Adhikari and Nishank Bala from our virus laboratory has joined us. So, okay, let's go ahead and start with our first question. Uh, where do we find information on how to propagate a virus from the ATCC catalog? Um, you can uh, uh, find the information uh, about the viruses in um, ATCC website, atcc.org. Um, you can type in the item number or the virus that you're interested in, and then the um, you click on that, and the information can be obtained from the 
product information. And if you know the virus or you know the lot number, you can also type in the lot number and you can get more information about that virus from certificate of analysis as well. All right, well, thanks, Anima. Good answer, good answer. Um, now for our next question, what are some troubleshooting methods that could be performed if I'm not achieving a good signal through immunofluorescence assays? Uh, for that one, um, you, if you are not picking up a good signal from uh, IFA assays, you can either, if it's a DNA virus, you can try PCR. Or um, if it's the RNA virus, you can try RT-PCR. If those things are not working and you are working with cells like Bureau's or A549, you can also try doing plaque assay to know um, that might be the better way of troubleshooting as well. All right. Good, good. Uh, another good answer from Anima. Um, I'm going to send this next one Megan's way. Do you inactivate? any of your viruses, and if so, what methods do you use? Oh, we do activate, inactivate some of them. Um, our most common methods are either diethyl ether, like a one-to-one -one ratio, or heat inactivation for the ones that can be. Okay. Um, now for this next question, and any of you guys can chime in on this one, have you encountered situations where the titer dropped precipitously between passages, and what did you do? Megan? I mean, yes, I've encountered one that did that. Um, your best option is to... Um, work with the virus, maybe the cell line is no longer able to hold, handle the virus that you're working with, you might want to look into other cell types. It could also be um, an interferon response from the cell line. If Nishnik wants to um, go into that a little bit more, you can. Yes. So, yes. So, like Megan said, the first thing we look for is uh, changing the cell line. Because sometimes uh, different passages of a cell line may not, or different stocks of a cell line may not support the virus anymore. Uh, the next thing we do look at is whether interferon is being made in um, by the cells. Because uh, very often that, like if your virus is interferon sensitive, that will um, basically drop the titer of the virus. And lastly, sometimes you just need to passage it a few more times to see if it uh, was just like a crisis phase for the virus and whether the virus recovers um, as it adapts to the cell line. This this usually happens if we get a stock that has either not been propagated in cell culture before or has been minimally propagated. And so it may take a few passages for a virus to adapt to a cell line during which point the the titer may drop. But it usually comes back once the virus adapts successfully. Nice, nice. Good answer, Nishant. So this next question I'm going to put out is a fairly general one. Um, do you use media supplements and what do they typically accomplish? Um, I can take this one. So yes, the for general cell culture, virus culture, the only media supplement we use is um, FBS to keep the cells alive. For some specific viruses, we may add um, things like trypsin um, as required by the virus. But in general, we try to keep supplements as low as possible to prevent any adverse effect on the, the cells or the virus. Okay, good. Good answer. Now, this next one is a specific question about troubleshooting host cell problems. I've been encountering issues with propagating influenza in my lab using MDCK cells. The negative control 
and the infected flask monolayers are lifting too quickly because of the trips in concentration. Do you have any suggestions on how to select um, the appropriate trips and concentration for propagation of the virus without harming the cells uh, in the process? Um, I can take this one. So you really need to look at the enzyme activity of your stock solution and do a dilution of the trypsin and treat it the cells and try and find the best concentration for that cells with that specific stock concentration. Um, and that should help you out a good bit in that regard. Okay, thanks, Megan. Now, um, this next question has come in, I'm actually going to take. Um, I saw that ATCC used CRISPR gene editing to optimize cell lines for viral transduction and production. What cell lines were used? How was this done? And uh, are they available? So I, I guess to answer the last question first, yes, they are available. Uh, what our R&D did was use CRISPR to engineer a STAT1 knockout in Vero and MDPK cells. We have some application data, it's really interesting actually, showing a tenfold increase in GFP and dengue viral production in the Vero STAT1 knockout cell line. And then the MDCK STAT1 knockout line showed a similar, actually greater than tenfold increase in influenza A production. Uh, we actually did a webinar on this uh, back in March that shows this data and more. So um, thanks for asking. So now I guess I'll go ahead and move on to the next question for our panelists. What is the viral counter? Is it an instrument? Um, I can take this one. Yes, there is, the viral counter is an instrument. Um, it's a fairly new instrument, at least modern versions of it. Um, they can count uh, the total number of viral particles in a solution. The new models can also tell you things like, is a viral particle um, structurally defective or is is the is it empty in that, is there any viral genome in the particular particle being analyzed. So these are the things the viral counter can do, and it can give you a fairly good idea of how many viral particles are there in a solution and, and how many might be structurally defective. Now, what it can't do is give you, like, it is not equivalent to an infectious unit um, assay because while it can tell you what particles are structurally deficient, it can't tell you whether any, like, um, mutations in the virus genome that may look like the particle is is okay, but it makes the particle non-infectious. So it's the virus counter data is best used as a supplement to an infectious cider assay because the two do give you a different thing. But for a quick analysis of whether you have viral particles in a solution and, and what the total number of particles are, it's it's a good instrument to use. Okay, good, good. Now, um, here's another question from the same asker, actually. For the IFA method for virus quantification, can the one-spot signal consider one infectious virus? So for that one, I would say uh, no. You would need at least a generalized, at least um, five or six um, positive cells in the same well to consider it a positive well. A one-spot signal could just be um, staining that went wrong or something like that. It's it's too weak to really call a positive signal. Okay. Now. This next question, um, I think I'm going to uh, direct to Nishank. Um, can the read munch method be applied to all kinds of viruses to calculate their titer? Um, so the read munch works best when a virus has clear cytopathic effects. Uh, so you need a virus 
to be able to show some kind of cytopathic effect um, in order for the read munch method to be used. The other um, virus, the other category of viruses that it'll work for is if obviously if you can dilute the virus um, adequately, so you can you can combine the read munch method with an immunofluorescent stain. Um, the viruses it doesn't necessarily work with are ones that have no cytopathic effect um, or ones that might be cell associated and so propagate very slowly. Um, or ones that are that are persistently infected cells. In those cases, you do have to combine the read munch with um, a way of quantifying the number of uh, virus, of replicating virus particles or um, units in in your sample. So the read munch itself is just a mathematical calculation that uses input data from a number of sources to give you an output titer. Um, Traditionally, the read munch has been used by looking for CPE, but now you can you can do the same by using IFA or even PCR for that matter. Okay, that the very nice answer, Nishank. Thank you. So, okay, we've had we've got a ton of questions coming in. Um, so, moving on to the next one. How can I obtain a detailed protocol for determining the MOI of the virus I purchased from ATCC? I need to use an MOI of 10 for my assay. So, so our um, protocols, so to speak, are internal, uh, but we use a standard PCID 50 in most cases to determine the MOI. I believe that is stated in the certificate of analysis for uh, each virus. Um, it is up to the individual lab to determine, for example, what uh, if they want to use a specific cell type or a specific media. Um, our MOI is usually like the, the MOI that we give in our certificate of analysis is usually associated with um, the cell line and the the time that it was needed to propagate the virus. So there is no detailed protocol for downloading as such, but any TCID50 protocol can be used to determine the MOI or a plaque assay or a PCR. I mean that is up to uh, that is up to the the person doing the experiment. Right, right. And um, to download that C of A, um, be sure to have handy your uh, lot or batch number. Uh, and if you have any uh, issues in, in finding the lot and batch number, if you didn't write it down in your lab notebook or if you don't have the original vial still, um, you can reach out to our technical service representatives for that information. Okay. so. Um, to the next question, um, can you speak to how you virus the HCoV-229E as well as uh, why you only use the TCID-50 to titer instead of plaque assay? And, and then just kind of a follow-up to that, I mean, can you correlate TCID-50 to um, plaque forming unit? Yeah, I can take this one. So we harvest the HCoV-229E by looking for CPE. So assuming we find, um, I believe our internal recommendation is for um, a specific amount of CPE. I think it's fairly high, uh, close to 70 to 90 percent. Um, and wait, no, uh, it's not quite that. High. It's it's lower. Um, but we harvest at a specific CPE that we're targeting. Uh, and we use TCID50 uh, to titer it just because that is our internal assay of reference. Uh, of course, you can do a plaque assay. The plaque assays have been published uh, in the past uh, or in the literature for using this virus. Uh, so it's really the preference of the person who's using this virus as to go with the TCID50 titer or the plaque assay titer. As far as correlating TCID50 to PFU, um, we like there. 
it has to be determined empirically. So it's very hard to say whether one DC-8050 unit is equivalent to a given number of PFUs. Um, this has to be determined empirically, and it will be different for each uh, lot of the virus. And it also depends on the cell line you use and, and how long you're letting the DC-8050 go or how long you're letting the black acid go. So these things are, um, they have to be determined empirically, and there is no direct way to correlate the two assays. Okay, good, good answer. Now this next question is kind of interesting. Um, how much better is flash freezing virus in liquid nitrogen first versus freezing at minus 80 degrees? Could you repeat that question? I'm sorry. I, it got yeah, sure, sure, um, Shank. So how much better is flash freezing the virus in liquid nitrogen first versus freezing it at minus 80 degrees only? Um, so our what we have found at ADCC is that flash freezing at liquid nitrogen is better generally and long-term storage of the virus should also be done at liquid nitrogen. At minus 80, it, it, it can be done, and I believe that uh, many people do that. We often do the same for, for certain of our viruses, uh, especially for working R&V samples. But for, for best results, for best long-term results, um, flash freezing at minus at liquid nitrogen and also storing your viruses long-term at liquid nitrogen. Uh, Liquid nitrogen is the best. Okay, good answer, good answer. So for this next question, um, what is the ideal concentration for Vero and C636 cell subcultures? And at what concentration is it recommended to freeze these cells? And and there's actually a little bit of a follow-up to this. Um, how many cell passage numbers are recommended to use? Um, or are they infinite? Um, okay, I can I can take this one. Uh, mm -hmm. So the ideal concentration for subculturing cells like Vero's and C636s is uh, dependent on the application. There is I I would hesitate to say there is one specific concentration you should use to subculture always. Um, if you want your cells to grow faster, you subculture at a higher concentration. If you want them to grow slower, at a lower concentration. Um, so it really just depends on the 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 application that the cells are going to be used for. Um, as far as the number of cell passages. We generally don't passage cells more than 10 times before we bring out another vial of cells. Um, I know this practice differs in other places, but the, the higher the cell number, the higher the cell passage number, the greater the chance of the cell to become aberrant or mutate or even simply die. And so we keep the passage number to about 10. That being said, the how many passages the cells can go. Some cells can keep going for a very long time, 40, 50 passages. Some cells may go for only three or four passages. Uh, it, that depends on the cell. And the last part of the question was, what concentration to freeze these cells? Um, I, I would say that also depends on how many cells you want to freeze down. There is an upper limit. Uh, but there's a very wide range of what concentration you you can freeze the cells. So, for example, you can take cells from a T150 flask and freeze about six to ten vials out of that. Um, that's that's one recommended concentration for Vero's. Uh, but you can you can freeze them at a fairly uh, there's a fairly broad range uh, to freezing them down. 
Okay, good answer. Yeah, I mean, if if you have any real questions about that, you can go to the um, product detail pages um, on our website actually for Zero Cells. I know we have an MDCK um, and and many others that are used. Um, we have, we have good culturing um, information, tips and techniques, and that sort of thing, and good starting points for for that. So so thank you. Um, and yeah, I would also say ten passages. Um, now for this next question, this sort of flips that question a little bit. Um, how many passages are propagations of a virus? before there's genetic drift. So we talked about for the cells, now we're talking about for the virus itself. Uh, yes, so this is again dependent on the virus. It is actually dependent on the mutation rate of the virus. So some viruses within a single passage, you will start seeing mutations that have an effect on the phenotype of the virus. Um, for some viruses, like there is um, they can propagate for a while before you start seeing uh, changes in their genetic code. It's generally RNA viruses that are much quicker to mutate, uh, as that is part of their evolutionary survival strategy, um, whereas DNA viruses, especially DNA viruses that encode for error correction mechanisms, will have a much slower rate of uh, genetic drift. So the the answer to this question is it just depends on the virus and if and there's and the number of passages that it might require for virus to mutate is also heavily contextual. It depends on the cell line you're using. It depends on uh, the MOI. It depends on you know are there any uh, evolutionary pressures being put on the virus during culturing. So it can depend on all of these things and it really. Um, yeah, it depends on all of these things, and there's no specific number because it is uh, contextual on the experiment being performed. Okay, good. So, excellent answer. So now, have you ever run into the issue where influenza shows no infectivity on the first dilution during titer check, but shows on the lower dilutions, and if so, um, how did you fix it? Um, to my knowledge, we have not run into this issue. So I may not be able to answer this question for you. Um, I do have some insight. If you're running into a lot of tighter issues with influenza, I suggest using our MDCK knockout line um, to try and get higher tires of influenza. Thanks, Megan. Good answer. <laughs> I like it. So here's another question, um, and and it's uh, more or less along the same lines of sometimes I faced a problem with influenza virus propagation, like um, in very first propagation after four passages, they didn't have a good titer of the virus. Um, so there's the one suggestion that, um, you know, go to a statlin knockout cell line or for example, to to increase the titer, um, and anything else? Um, I mean, you can try a different cell line. That's probably the the biggest one. Um, you can try to change the trypsin concentration. You may just want to keep passaging it for a while before the virus grows out. Uh, but sometimes viruses don't adapt that. It, it may be an issue with the specific strain of the influenza being used because it might not be um, willing to adapt to the cell line. Okay. Oh, good, good answer. Good answer. Now, how would you troubleshoot negative control cells that appear to show cytopathic effects along with the positive virus infected cells? Um, and they go on to say that the PCR results show no RNA in the negative cell culture when the positive shells, cells did show RNA. So in this case, um, 
you know, my guess is the CPE is showing up because the cells have either become overconfluent or that this this these particular cells don't do well with a high density in the in the well or the plate. So in in the case where you're seeing CPE in both the negative control and the virus infected cells, but PCR is showing you no RNA, the recommendation is to use a titer method that is in addition to CPE, so like immunofluorescence would be a good idea, would be a good way to titer the virus because in that case you can titer earlier where you can you can titer just when your negative control cells are have no CPE, um, but you'll still be able to to see virus in those cells. So not necessary to use CPE in this case for the the titration. Uh, a different method of titering the virus would be would be better. Actually, PCR, like they did, would be used to titer the virus as well. All right, good, good. Now, um, this next question is interesting. Um, how do you use PCR to confirm plaque assays for viral infectivity when PCR does not represent viral infectivity? Uh, yes. So PCR is can only be used to confirm the presence or absence of virus. Uh, it obviously cannot tell you by itself whether there is virus in there in the solution unless you're doing a time course. So if you are doing a time course and you see virus, the level of virus in each dilution increasing over the course of the assay, then you can say that there's replicating virus by using PCR. But if you're just looking at an endpoint assay or just one time point, then the PCR will only tell you whether the viral genomic material is present in the sample or not. And you need a second method to verify that infectious viral particles are there. So PCR is best used as a complement to uh, a an, another assay that will look for infectious virus. Uh, but if you had to use it by itself, then you either want to use a time course or you look for a PCR product that is transient. So for example, in a positive sense RNA virus, you can look for the presence of the, you can isolate the negative strand uh, antigenome because that negative strand antigenome will only be present when there's replicating virus in the in the um in the in the cells. So PCR can be adapted to do um virus uh titration. You just have to be careful uh, as to whether you're looking for the actual replicating virus or the um just viral genomic material. But there are ways to to use PCR. Okay. No, that's good. Good answer. Um now do you know if it's possible to perform plaque assays for human coronavirus 229E in MRC5 cells, or do you have to use another host cell line? Um, so I, to my knowledge, we have not tried MRC5 cells or it hasn't worked. Um, we, we, we just go with the cell line that we recommend. Um, on the product web page. So I would recommend going using that cell line. And and I mean, obviously you can try a different cell line, but we don't have any data and we can't give you any guarantee that a cell line like MRC5s will work for 229E. All right. Well, at this time, I guess we'll conclude our Q&A session. So I'd really like to thank our speakers for the excellent presentation. And um, thank you, Anima and Nishank, for um, joining us as well uh, for the Q&A session. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. Uh, just one final word. We've got a couple of uh, webinars coming up. On May 19th, Jonathan Jacobs presents his talk on genomic data quality, connecting the dots between bioinformatics and physical materials. And then on May 26th, Steve Budd and James Clinton will present their webinar, 
on tips and techniques for successfully culturing organoids. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you.